So Zoe Roy is an art award-winning rebel with a cause. Uh, Netita Dene and Michif. Zoe is a citizen of Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation in Northern Saskatchewan and is based in Ottawa, Ontario. She has a Bachelor of Education, a Master of Public Policy, and is now pursuing a PhD in education at York University. We are super happy that she's ours from Saskatchewan. You guys can borrow her out, out east there, but uh, she got to come home. <laughs> Natasha McDonald is Inuk and currently a PhD student in the Department of Education at Concordia University. McDonald specializes in intercultural communication and English second language learning via social media in Inuit communities where Inuktitut is still a first language. Rylan McCollum is a Métis Anishinaabe and a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation, now living on... Gosh, Rylan, you're going to have to name the territory for me. Okay. A Musqueam traditional territory. Rylan is completing his Master's of Science degree in Experimental Medicine at the University of British Columbia. Missy LeBlanc is a Métis Nehiao Polish member of the Métis Nation of, of Alberta. She is a curator, researcher, and writer based on the prairies. Awarded the Middlebrook Prize for Young Canadian Curators in 2019, she is currently working towards a Master of Arts in Cultural Studies, Curatorial Practices from the University of Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory. Please welcome our student witnesses for the forum's final presentation this year. Everyone hear me? No. I'm... Oh, check, check. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's pretty loud. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone who organized this. I have some notes here, so I'm just going to read off. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for organizing the event and having us here. I'm honored to be a, a student witness. Um, as as he mentioned, my name is Rylan McCollum. I'm Métis and Anishinaabe and Scottish, uh, and I'm a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation. Uh, I grew up in Morden, Manitoba, uh, which is about, uh, is on Treaty 1 territory, about four and a half hours east of here. Um, and yeah, my, my family, uh, my Métis family is mainly Delorms um, and McDougals. Uh, and so I'm, I'm proud to know that and uh, carry that with me. And it was cool. I met another another Delorme here, so that was that was fun. Um, I'm currently a Master's of Science student uh, in experimental medicine at the University of British Columbia. Um, I I'm new to being a witness, uh, as I'm sure um, we all are, uh, and so I want to acknowledge that that's uh, an important job. Uh, and witnessing goes goes beyond seeing and hearing. Uh, it involves understanding, and this includes uh, this responsibility to carry knowledge. Uh, with us and and share that knowledge. So today I'm going to uh, speak about specific issues and solutions that I've witnessed. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge uh, that this is my perspective. Uh, it may be unique, but it's not universal. Uh, this is just my perspective. Uh, so Dr. Aubin stayed, uh, started by by stating something at the beginning of the conference that stuck with me. Uh, it was along the lines of, of we're going to make mistakes in the policies we make, but let's learn from them. So last year's witnesses spoke about awkwardness due to the unique cultural ways that we're having to navigate in this space. Uh, we've never been here before, uh, but we need to sit in that awkwardness um, and not hold our tongues. Uh, so if we want to find solutions, uh, it's important. There's important ways of of seeing and knowing that that we as Indigenous people carry with us, and this includes all Indigenous people, uh, community members, families, our elders. And that's why we need to be the ones that, that have the final says on these important issues. So just like it was suggested uh, that we have elders and community members at our institutions when we're hiring, um, we want 
and we, when we want to see change in institutional policy. This is not something that's easy to voice. There's no one solution. We're all from different institutions and diverse nations. Uh, and although we might not be able to make a plan or that we may be able to make a plan and recommendations, uh, these will look different on how we actually bring about them across the country at different institutions. Uh, and it kind of goes against that Western way of, of knowing and thinking that there's this one right answer to the solution. Uh, there's no blanket solution. Each community in each area of Canada uh, must come up with their own different solutions. However, we can lead nationally um, on ways of going for helping our institutions uh, if they're ready to ask for help. Uh, we need to take the time and do this properly. Um, as people talked about, uh, take in perspectives, hear from everyone, continue a conversation. And this means multiple forums like this. Uh, this is a great start, but we need to continue this work and have other witnesses share their knowledges across events. Uh, this is a slow process uh, and it, it is frustrating at some times, but um, it could ensure that we don't do more damage than we do good. Uh, I've heard from many people that um, it is too soon to bring non-Indigenous voices into this space uh, because as we heard, it's still not even a safe space for all the Indigenous people here. As you know, this is difficult work, especially in regard to speaking up. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of Indigenous women speaking out and, being, and people being called out across the country uh, for fraudulent behavior, all women. So we must recognize that this state going forward, we need Indigenous men to speak up um, because there is fraudulent men in these institutions. And we also need to fight alongside women and help uplift them. Uh, so now I want to actually discuss the, the people committing fraud. Uh, these aren't middle school teachers uh, in the middle of nowhere, Manitoba. Uh, these are people at the highest levels of academia and law and government applying and receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars um, that are supposed to go to Indigenous people. And as they're even Canadian research chairs and leaders and, and policymakers, these are smart, manipulative people. And at institutions and agencies at these high levels, uh, there needs to be some sort of accountability and ability to discipline. Uh, as someone who talks to high-level academics all the time, specifically Indigenous high-level academics, citizenship and family is, is often an enjoyable topic to have, uh, an enjoyable conversation. So I don't believe that it's unreasonable that we ask these people to talk about their citizenship and their families. Uh, even as an Indigenous student in the Faculty of Medicine looking to apply for awards and, and bursaries, I'm asked to prove my citizenship all the time. Um, so why do I have to show citizenship to go to medical school, which is an undergraduate level program at University of British Columbia, uh, but certain higher ups don't even have to show proof of Indigenous citizenship to lead the UBC Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. That's uh, damaging. So although there needs to be more discussion about specific actions we can take, such as having all new incoming Indigenous students and staff and faculty sign a declaration of honesty regarding their Indigenous identity, uh, it's important, important to recognize the main reason why we're all here, uh, which is students. Uh, there's no faculty or higher academia teaching without students. Students are being hurt um, by people falsely claiming to be Indigenous. These frauds and the work they do have lasting effects on us. And even after they're called out and leave the institutions, there's a ripple effect. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a graduate student in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC, and a majority of the work I do focuses on Indigenous patients and the care they're receiving in British Columbia. And so we have conversations all the time about, about racism in the BC healthcare system. And their only report on racism is the In Plain Sight report, and that's um, written and published by Mary Ellen Terpelafond. Uh, and this means that for my master's thesis, uh, the only report I have to cite is the In Plain Sight report and Mary Ellen's work. So every time I give presentations and talks and everything, I have to talk about the fact that it's written by her. Even though there were so, so many real Indigenous people behind her that actually made the report happen. She was a law professor and she wasn't even, a, I wasn't even a student to hers, so I can't even begin to imagine the harm and the lack of safety students, especially Indigenous graduate students of pretendians feel. Uh, I also want to kind of finish by acknowledging the importance of staff, meaning the, the non-tenure track professors, people that don't have the kind of job security at the universities. I'm here today because of Indigenous staff. And in my experience, a lot of change and fight at the universities happens because of the staff. And they shouldn't have to risk their jobs to make the universities a safer space for us Indigenous students. So thank you very much.
Can you hear me? All right. Um, I used to be an elementary school teacher, so if you need to shake it off a little bit, because we've had such a beautiful, beautiful two days, a lot of information. I know I was asleep before eight last night, although I live in Montreal, so that's really 10 p.m. my time. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, my name's Natasha McDonald. I'm from Kuchagapik uh, in uh, Nunavik, which is in Arctic Quebec. I do live in Montreal, but uh, that's uh, that's where I hail. Kuchagapik um, is one of the uh, 14 communities in Nunavik. Uh, we're a small, small, tiny uh, area. We only have about a population of about 10,000 people, small but mighty. Um, and uh, it is one of the only community. It is the only community on the Hudson Bay that has. Uh, pre-population and Inuit population living on the same land. So one of the benefits of living there is that you get bingo on the Inuit radio and bingo on the Cree radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, in, uh, Nunavik is part of Inuit Nunangat. So if you're familiar, we have four land claim regions in, in the North. So Nunavik is part of uh, Northern Quebec. So I, I do not claim to speak for Inuit and all of the four land claim regions as we've all shared over these last two days. We don't speak for everyone. Um, so when I speak, I speak from the knowledge uh, that I have and the way that I've lived from my home community and from my home region. I was at the table earlier trying to think of a, a metaphor that I could use. And I'm like, in the, the pie of life, I'm just that little slice of with all the ingredients made of all the places I've seen and been, you know? So I don't represent everything and I'm just a slice in what I know and what I've seen. Um, I am currently doing a PhD, as the uh, gentleman had uh, introduced. Uh, I'm very interested in intercultural communication because I am uh, someone from two different worlds, uh, two I'd see her. So my mom is Inuk, or was Inuk, I should say, and uh, sadly, she's not with us. Um, and my dad is Khadunat, which is uh, not Inuk, but white, red-haired, freckled, bird lobster red during the summertime. And um, so uh, this is, I've lived in that space in between their worlds, in between our worlds. I've had a foot in each world and always trying to negotiate meaning and understanding and, and uh, mediate <laughs> their lives and our lives. And I've always been in that space. Uh, where I am at Concordia, I'm the only indigenous person in my cohort, in my program. And so, uh, you know, we talked about being the pan-Indigenous -ind expert. So anytime something comes up that happens to be about Indigenous, it's like everybody looks at me. So what does Natasha think? I don't know. Um, and so uh, I had the opportunity of living in Gujarapik uh, and the opportunity of living in Miramichi, New Brunswick. If anybody knows that, that's where my dad's from. When we uh, moved to New Brunswick for a period of time, you know, I had that experience of being different because in Nunavik, we're the majority, you know, we live in our own land. These are isolated fly-in villages. We are nearly, you know, 95% Inuit. So moving to New Brunswick, I remember being screamed at from the bus, you know, go home, you seal killer, go back to your igloo and a bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to name, but that's always kept me guarded about protecting my identity and, and who I am. And it took me a long time to feel comfortable in both of the worlds that I live in. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for both my parents that instilled the pride in their culture and in each other's culture. So there was never a time where, you know, my dad was the bad khalunat and my mom was the, you know, the Inuk woman. It was, there was always mutual respect, even through divorce. <laughs> Um, so a little bit about my background, because I want to share with you the lens I'm coming from in during, uh, during this time of witnessing, you know, uh, as you can probably tell, I'm not, um, I'm not fresh out of my bachelor's degree. I've had a career of over 20 something years, uh, in mainly in, uh, corporate services, um, director of HR, assistant director of sustainable employment and that sort of thing, uh, 
uh, all within Inuit and Indigenous uh, First Nations uh, organizations, except for the uh, couple of years I spent teaching overseas and uh, the questionable period where I worked for the federal government. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I worked for, I was the senior director for Inuit Tepirit Kanatomi, uh, uh, ITK, our national Inuit representative organization. I was proud of the work we do. I worked for Katavik Elisignale Lirinik, our school board uh, that serves uh, Inuit in the north. Uh, I worked as a HR director for the Natawaganeg First Nation in uh, New Brunswick. And so all of my career, I focused on capacity building, ensuring that we have people representative in our organizations to be able to carry on the work that we need to do. And a lot of what I did was solve problems. So what I heard uh, and witnessed these last two days, I look at it from that lens, not to solve the problem, but I'm, I'm, that's what I'm listening for, the practicalities of all of this. And so, uh, what I say is my lens as a witness is that I'm building understanding and learning through our culture to main, maintain who we are. And I think that's, uh, that's something for me that was key in everything that I was uh, listening to. What I, how I saw the role of witness, I looked at it obviously through my little slice of pie. And so in Nunavik, you know, our traditional ways of learning is learning from our parents, learning from our elders, that's witnessing. Witnessing meaning like uh, Maligai, as uh, uh, Reipa this morning spoke from Ottawa on Zoom, if you remember our elder, you know, she was talking about our Inuit guiding principles, watching, listening, absorbing, and then applying the new knowledge uh, with the guidance. That to me was witnessing, and that's what I tried to take from the last two days. And so uh, the two themes that I saw uh, that I heard, I should say, uh, for me, with my lens, uh, are uh, related to one, our connectivity. And I don't mean our internet con connectivity necessarily, but I mean our connectivity, our relationships to each other, land, and to family. And the other, uh, the other topics that I, I focused in on were the need for systemic change. So that's been my field. That's, that's, that's what I did. And so uh, in terms of relationships and connectivity, you know, um, somebody, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm somebody, I'm that kind of person that you tell me your name, it's forgotten in, in 4.2 seconds, it's gone. So forgive me if I haven't named uh, people that, uh, that said these direct words, but when someone said earlier, where is your umbilical cord tied to? I thought that was beautiful. You know, uh, it's true for Inuit. Um, you know, we, we have a very relational, geographical, and familial way of connecting with each other. One of the few things, one of the many things that uh, you get asked when you travel into our communities, like Nanyu Uvi, like, where are you from? And Kina, Kina uh, Ananai, who's your mom? <laughs> you know, and then you get the story of, oh, and your auntie, oh, and your cousin, and oh, this, 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 and it's, it's wonderful, but that's how we know each other, right? And so, uh, and then you get the goodies on the cheeks, which is really a nice part of that. Um, now I move into uh, the other uh, the other things that I heard in relation to systemic change, and that's where that's what really caught me. You know, institutions, someone said, are designed to serve themselves, not the individual. And I can attest to that, having worked in systems, indigenous or Inuit or not, they're systems, and so they're designed to protect themselves to profit, to grow, to great, gain prestige, whatever whatever it may be, and it's not the individual. Um, and so identity fraud is certainly something that's, um, is definitely something that's a concern for each of our, you know, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, communities. It's certainly, a, it definitely is an issue. You know, uh, as a two white witness, I was watching in the news recently um, because we're more on the east side of Canada. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard about the, what's going on at Memorial University in Newfoundland. You know, and I think about that and I think about Hanina, uh, uh learning from the news story. You know, this is, this is, they learn about us through what they read in the news because they're not getting it at school necessarily. And so my point in saying that is, you know, there, we need to be clear when we talk about these issues on why fraud matters. Why does it matter to us? Why? Because, you know, for someone who knows nothing about our cultures, 
and they, they honestly want to learn and understand, they need to understand why it matters to us. And I think it's important when we talk about, uh, when we see journalists reporting on this, and I know they talked about their short turnaround time that they have to get a story out, but I hope that someday it would be, you know, uh, something that we could also start talking about, saying why it matters that this individual claimed that they were indigenous when they weren't. What does that mean? You know, and, and talking about, um, uh, determining indigeneity for us, you know, Indian, we're not covered under the Indian Act. Um, we're we're fall under the James Bay North Quebec uh, Agreement. We have a land claim, and so under our land claim, we are called Inuit beneficiaries, and it's our own land holding uh, within each town that determines the beneficiary list of who's a beneficiary or not. We determine it within ourselves. I think that's a really good system. You know, if we start thinking about different systems that we may want to try, but I have to caution, you know, it's not always fair. So we have to be careful with that too. And so um, in terms of systemic change, we have to caution that uh, in my experience working for the feds and other institutions, somebody said institutions are like dinosaurs, hard to move slow, 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 believe me, that's why I didn't stay long there, just to make any little bit of change just took months and years, so much red tape and bureaucracy, that's, that's not how I wanted to be in work. And it takes time, you know, change takes time, but someone else also said, but with great numbers comes change. So the more of us that are able to speak up, speak out, share our concerns, the more change we can impact on these dinosaurs, on these systems. And so uh, these institutions, let's also remember that they benefit from being indigenous friendly. Right? They have a reputation to say, well, you know, we follow the, uh, the uh, uh, calls to action where we're indigenous friendly, we want to you know, uh, welcome Indigenous students who want to show, look at our numbers, and they benefit from that. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that they're evil, but I'm saying that they're, it's, a, it's an institution. And so we need to make sure that they're accountable. As a student, I say that they need to be accountable. And as someone who used to work in corporate services, organizations always need to be held accountable. And so from my corporate services HR lens, uh, my practical side, you know, uh, how can we uh, ensure, um, you know, better, uh, uh, honest, authentic, true, whatever word we want to use, representation within these organizations, within these academic institutions, you know. One, uh, I was at a table yesterday, I had the uh, opportunity to listen in on a, a really great conversation. I actually didn't even circle the room because the, the, the responses and the dialogue was so great. I'm winking at the table now. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of the individuals at that table talked about using committees to vet. You know, if you have concerns, you have questions uh, as an institution and you don't know how to deal with that question, you know, start with HR because I've been in HR for many years and I most almost always was the only HR person in that organization. So I had to use my lens, you know, to vet the, the CVs that come in. And then when you get to the interview, that's where you have an opportunity to vet there by having representation on your communities. You know, um, uh, I always want to call her Rebika, but it's Rima uh, from this morning. Um, she, you know, she talked about Inuit Haimatuhangi, which is, you know, our indigenous traditional knowledge, or our Inuit traditional knowledge. And with that, we value consensus, belonging, respecting others. And I think that's what these communities could be. You know, it's part of our uh, traditional knowledge to use uh, uh, consens consens consensus building. And so uh, one thing I'd like to highlight, uh, because it did work for one of the individuals at our table, not individual, but where she worked, was use, uh, having elders also on uh, the committees uh, to, uh, uh, to, to vet people wanting to come in, to the candidates. And so um, one of the, um, one of the uh, measures that an institution can use are policy change. And I think that uh, that comes from uh, top down often, right? So you have to have leadership that believes that because policy doesn't change without there being a will from the top of the organization. And that is key. 
uh, you know, uh, if they want to demonstrate their commitments to reconciliation, they will make these policy changes. They will make these changes to their HR processes. They will make these commitments to having uh, representation uh, on their committees. I was uh, recently at an interview uh, at a university, which I won't name here because I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, and so uh, during that interview, I was asked very directly, you know, uh, uh, how, how do you, how do you, how are you, how do you explain your Inupness, how are you Inu, like how, what is your claim to indigeneity? And I went, it, those were not the words because, you know, you're nervous during an interview and I was, uh, I didn't get the, all the words clear in my head. Um, but I said, that's fantastic. Because, you know, it showed to me that they were serious. That they were serious. Because it was for a position specific for uh, indigenous uh, recruitment. And I thought that was fantastic because you need to ask them. And if you know if you have nothing to worry about, you're comfortable with that question. So part of that is being respectful, which is part of our culture, so part of uh, uh, as well. And you know, um, we uh, we want to be able to uh, bring people in who are who they are, because if an, if an organization really wants to have indigenous staff. They need to walk the walk and talk the talk, and they need to support, and they need to uh, do the vetting that they need to do. If ever, when there's a situation that there's a case of fraud, as we heard uh, recently in Memorial, and not what a, a lot of the discussion has been here these last two days here in the uh, western part of Canada, you know, when there's a fraud case, there was one, uh, one lady that spoke about how what they did at their institution, which was bring them in. Bring them into a talking circle and let them explain. Be open. Let them give them the opportunity to explain why, you know, there seems to be a discrepancy in their credentials or whatever we want to call it. And you know, there were I think seven cases that that person had referred to, and not one of them had decided to come to the uh, circle. So you know, when you put your feet to the fire, and if you have to come and defend it, well. You know, but give them that opportunity because that's part of who we are too, being respectful, listening, giving the opportunities. But if they can't, if they can't demonstrate who they are, where they're from, or their umbilical cord, whatever that looks like, then, you know, the onus is on them. So, in conclusion, um, I want to say that, uh, you know, in my culture, as in I think everybody's culture is here, from what I've seen, what I've heard, and what has been so beautiful for me uh, was uh, is the inclusion of elders. It's our elders. They are who we learn from. They are the ones who uh, are grounded with lived experience through all the decades uh, of change that have happened over these years. Uh, you know, if my mom was alive, you know, uh, she was born in a sod house in, you know, outside of Kutarapik, out on the land. And here I am having the opportunity to do my PhD. I feel very fortunate, very fortunate in the short amount of time that we've had to change in, in Nunavik, you know, less than 60, 70 years, we went from living on the land to this. And so, you know, elders guide the way. And uh, I wanted to share an example when we were uh, yesterday getting prepared uh, for uh, the opening. Um, there was a gentleman uh, who, uh, an elder, I'm trying to see if he's here, uh, an elder who uh, st stood up in the back of the room and uh, because he wanted to ensure that we uh, gave the solemn respect for the prayer that we needed to give. And, you know, from the back of the room, everybody understood. The people that were standing up with him, the whole room then stand up, stood up. And that shows to us, you know, the level of uh, awareness and understanding and respect that we have, we still have, that we should have, that we must continue to have for our elders. Someday we'll be elders. I'm not that far. And, you know, they know how hard it was to be proud of our indigeneity and to have it taken away. We've heard those stories here. They know how hard it was. They lived through those years of turmoil and change. And we need to learn from that. My little struggle of being called a seal killer and go back to your igloo and stuff like that, you know, that was hard. 
but it wasn't like what my mom must have lived through. She didn't speak enough to do that home. She went through a federal day school. She never spoke of it. I had to learn it from someone her own age that my mother actually went through that. I didn't know at the time, you know? So we need to, we need to keep that link with our elders, maintain it. It's too precious um, not to protect who we are. Nakomi, thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much, everyone. Just before we uh, continue, we're just going to uh, reboot our live stream. I've uh, just been given word that uh, a little bit of technical difficulties, we just want to make sure we capture uh, the conversation for everybody. So as soon as I get the thumbs up, uh, we're going to resume this panel and Missy's ready to go. We are good to go. Hello, uh, my name is Missy LeBlanc. I am Métis Nehu, I'm Polish and a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. I came here this week to witness these important conversations from Winnipeg and Treaty 1 Territory and the homeland of the Métis, where I am a graduate student at the University of Winnipeg in the Cultural Studies Program. I'm originally from and live most of my life on the traditional territory of my people in Amiskwishi, Muskegon, Edmonton. Both my parents were born, raised, and born and raised in Edmonton, and they are survivors of the 60 Scoop. My mother is a non-status Nehio Esqueo, and my father is a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. My maternal grandfather, Michael Dohaniak, and his family were Polish settlers and settled in what is now known as Central Alberta prior to the province joining Confederation in 1905. My maternal grandmother was a Kulinier from Canoe Lake First Nation, uh, but I would like to make it clear that I do not claim to be from that nation or have a connection to Canoe Lake, as I am still on my path to learning about and connecting to that part of my familial history. Paternally, both my grandparents were Métis, and through them, I am a descendant of the Red River and Lac Saint Anne Métis communities, as well as the Papas Chase First Nation. My grandfather was Victor LeBlanc, and he was born in Mearns, Alberta in 1936, and his parents were Louis LeBlanc and Mary Ida Rotat. Uh, my grandmother was Marie Josephine Ernestine Patricia Lerondel, and she was born in Lac in 1941, and her parents were Burton Lerondel and Delima Lettisor. Through my grandpa Vic, I am connected to the uh, Bell Courts and the Lorondells, and through my grandma Pat, I am connected to many Métis family lines, including the Lattisers, Beaudries, Lavallees, Lawyers, Brelins, Desmarais, Lesperance, Grants, and Ogers. Um, also, I would like to just ask for a bit of patience. I am currently suffering from a concussion, um, so I might come in and out, even though I do have a script in front of me. Um, so this is going to be a bit short and sweet compared to the last two. Uh, when I was first called on to bear witness for these important yet difficult and heavy conversations, although honored, I was hesitant, as I wasn't sure as if I was the right person to carry this responsibility. This is because I have very recently and without my consent found myself intimately entangled in a case of this type of fraud at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, and many people in this room know who I am speaking about. Myself, as well as other past and present students, academics, artists, and cultural workers have been harmed in countless ways by this person's uh, actions including academically, culturally, financially, personally, physically, professionally, and psychologically. I'm currently working on holding this person accountable for the harm that they have caused me through the University of Winnipeg's Human Rights and Diversity Office. However, it is taking up the vast majority of my time and capacity these days. I've had to drop out of classes, extend my stay at the University of Winnipeg, and uh, continue it's, it's held up my degree uh, in more ways than one. Uh, with all of this in mind, I wavered on whether or not I should accept the responsibility of being a keeper of history. However, after consulting with friends, family, and mentors, I accepted the invitation as I felt that I could offer a unique perspective when it came to witness my testimony, to my witness testimony, but also that attending this event would allow me to learn from others that have gone through what I am currently going through. Uh, I wanted to approach my role as witness from a neutral perspective, actively listening to what others had to say and being mindful not to color the things that I heard with my own biases. 
Although I heard many conversations about various topics on this matter, there were three major themes that kept coming up and were lingering in the background in these conversations that I wanted to bring forward. I don't really have any sort of solutions or um, provocations from these. I just think they are three important themes um, that we need to continue speaking about and uh, working through as these forums and gatherings and conversations continue. Um, the first is that many people in this room do not understand the history of the Métis and what it means to be Métis. Um, I've heard from many people say that when folks at their institutions claim to be Métis, they either just accept it out of fear of being wrong, or when they wanted to move ahead with vetting these people, they didn't know who to ask or what, where to begin. This is something that I've heard time and time again in any time I'm in a mixed First Nations, Métis, and Inuit space, uh, as I'm sure many other Métis folk in this room have as well. It is alienating, it is disheartening, it is frustrating. Um, oftentimes when you are the only Métis person in the room, you have to, and speaking on large, uh, like, indigeneity as like an umbrella have to sit there and first educate uh, the folks that are First Nations and in Inuit because they just they just don't know and uh, it it gets tiring to have to start every conversation with just an explanation and a at times it seems can be a defense that Métis people like we are Indigenous um, and a lot of the folks that I've speak, been speaking to here and just listening to over the past two days, you know, there's a want for more education but, and there's a want to do things right um, and to uh, listen to the Métis Nation in terms of citizenship and membership and vetting, but people just don't know where to go. People just don't even know where to start. Um, there's been suggestions of potentially a national registry for Métis um, that it's vetted through. Um, but I think this is a conversation that needs to continue. And I think, you know, uh, some self-education also needs to happen on people's behalf. The second major theme that I saw uh, was about it was a dichotom dichotomy that was presented between kindness and anger. Uh, which has caused quite a bit of tension in this space. All of us in this space have been cautioned to approach the subject and the people entangled within it with kindness. And folks that have been personally impacted by fraudsters are rightfully angry. They've been ostracized, ignored, and harmed in numerous ways. They are burnt out and tired. Um, and this is my own personal opinion on the matter, is that I feel as if kindness is being conflated with being nice. Um, niceness, in my opinion, is based in people pleasing and morality, and which, you know, our current society is currently structured on a like Judeo-Christian morality, um, which I don't particularly care about, whereas being kind is based in ethics. Um, Count, asking for accountability is care. You can do it with kindness. Asking, being critical of someone's actions and being uh, constructive, offering constructive criticism is kindness. You are asking these people to do better because you want them to do better. Um, and I think, you know, that is, it's a nuanced conversation and it might seem like semantics, you know, kindness versus niceness. But you can still move forward with being, you can still be angry and do things with kindness. You can still, you know, just because you're angry doesn't mean the things that you are doing are, are not based in kindness. Um, so I think that's just something that's kind of, I, I personally have to sit with marinating on a bit for a couple of days and what that is. But I think that's like, a, I've noticed that's a bit of a tense subject here. Um, the third theme that kind of stood out to me over the past few days uh, is how this phenomena is inextricably linked with colonialism and white supremacy, um, which I think is very important to name because there is always, again, in these mixed First Nations, Métis, and Inuit spaces, 
um, that I've been in at least over the past year or two is that people are very, very uncomfortable about talking about race and people are very uncomfortable um, when they are either white coated or white presenting or just lighter skinned um, indigenous person acknowledging their proximity to whiteness and the privilege that has come with that. Um, however, you know, that's not to say that being lighter skinned makes you any less indigenous, any less Métis, any less First Nations from your particular nation or Inuit. It is, you know, it's just genetics. It's just nobody has control about that. Um, and it is an uncomfortable conversation. Um, but I think it's someone something that we have to continuously bring forward in these gatherings and forums um, because they are, th this issue is inextricably linked with white supremacy. Um, and it was iterated by many people that it is a Canadian or settler problem, but that it is us as Indigenous people that are left addressing it after we've already been harmed. Uh, Jean Tay spoke on acknowledging that being a citizen or a member of a nation is a p political identity and not a racial identity, which I know it's, I think for myself, you know, seeing it as one as like a legal definition and then one as like a cultural understanding of what it means. I think that's a conversation that still needs to keep going and it seems to be at its infancy and I don't think that there's one right answer. Um, and Dr. Tim, and finally Dr. Kim Talbert spoke on the social construction of race and how current EDI and anti-racist initiatives within these institutions are perpetuating this phenomena as they don't really provide the space necessary to address the specific equity needs of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And I think, you know, just from what I've seen personally at the University of Winnipeg, um, this is, I would say that's correct, but also like that this is, this is how they're approaching it through an EDI perspective, through an anti-racist perspective, but it's not actually addressing this very specific harm uh, that was done, the, the cultural harm that was done by this person claiming to be Métis when they are not Indigenous in any respect whatsoever, um, and continuously addressing it through the viewpoint of uh, equity and diversity is, you know, doing harm to countless students and staff at the university. And I think this is something that, um, again, no solution or answer or anything, but that we, as like a lot of you are staff and faculty at um, institutions is you know, maybe with what you can do within your position, because you do hold positions of power, um, is a way to maybe create sustainable systemic changes to kind of push on those EDI initiatives a bit in terms of making them also more specific to the equity needs of the uh, Indigenous community and nations that you serve where your institutions are located. Um, that is currently all that I have to say. Um, but yeah, I think... I just want to say thank you to everyone that spoke over the past two days, to all of the elders um, who have taken time uh, to share their perspectives. Um, I know these are, and for everyone that traveled all the way here, I think these are really important conversations, and I think it's just the start of them, um, and that we do need to keep going. Hey, Dante. Okay. Um, Zoe Roy, Neya Dene and Majif from Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. Uh, I also have roots in Black Lake, Dene Sutlene Nation, and Green Lake. I, I had really big plans of coming up here, like super fun. but I see like so many of my witnesses here. So I'm gonna start out with a wrap and I'm gonna preface this that by saying that without black liberation, I would not have found my way to sovereignty. 
I also want to draw your attention to this book, The Power of Story. I want to invite you to take some time with it. It's healing. It's love. The I have attachment issues with my mom. I don't know if all of us have mom issues, but I love my mom so deeply. I've spent a lot of time trying to do the work in the institution to try to make a better life for my family. And recently I've been having a lot of miscarriages and through my work on myself, I realized that I've been trying to fight off the demons, trying to protect myself so much that I became weak. And now I'm ready to start in the center and know that I can let my life giver find her path. And I have my own life giver and I have my own path. And I feel really compelled to just say that because you are my witnesses. It only takes once. I tried twice, but I failed to know. Now I better myself with mistakes and the rules that I broke. I talk the tone of a thug that I never really knew, but somewhere in the mix, this is how I grew to be the disco queen I always dreamed to be. Now I get the best of both worlds and I L-O-V-E in the right way. And I'd say thanks to all of you, a compilation of different societies viewed. I grew up with all of you and I more than listened to your stories. Then I took it to my cell and it did so much more for me. I took a stroll in your kicks and I did just fine. But listen, what I just said was clearly a lie. I lived a good life and then I explored the gritty and now I'm skipping to the top, but y'all could roll with me. I stood at a halt, which led to endless attention. I passed out on the spot and I suddenly resented. I hated authority when discipline was implemented, so I pieced off the square and a new life was presented. I had a friend who swore she'd be there till the end, but she told me and pretend, so I pieced out again. I could be straight when I say I'm always on the run. I live life with a goal, but I wake up for fun. You only live once, this ain't as good as it gets. Take it as it comes and with no regrets. Like I said, I grew up sociocultural, blessed with parents who showed me my life at a partial. Now I'm on a journey to fulfill the pieces of the articles, make it a book and then while I compile all the particles. So this is for those who have and now know me. Thank you for your touches in the mix of Zoe. This poem I wrote when I was 17, it was, the, it was a poem that I wrote when I was struggling in, in, in and out of jail, but I read this poem for the first time. I remember being so nervous standing behind Maria Campbell and she was gonna read and then I was gonna read and I was like, oh my God, I'm standing behind Maria Campbell. And I just wanted to follow her for the rest of my life. And I did. <laughs> My tummy is turning and I could hear my body saying, don't forget about me. So I just had to be present and show you who is speaking to you. This is uh, words completely unfinessed. Not every good, and not everything's gonna hit, but I'm gonna read it. Here we go. Gonna ask my tin for inviting me to be a witness here for creating this space to amplify the nuance of our ways of knowing and the challenges we're up against with the week ago. We're not meant to do this alone. This morning I was reminded of a song that these kids made, grade ones. They said, being a kid never gets old. It's fun being a kid in the candy store. We don't know who we wanna be, but we sure know who we are. And I'm also reminded when you say you're from Canoe Lake, well, in the Canoe Lake, the kids told me that five plus can take you anywhere. <laughs> exactly. In short, I can see that we're just too deadly. But here, I'm reminded 
that the system is meant to grow, and so are we. We, as people of this land, we can pick up Canada like a Rubik's Cube, take interest in it as long as we need to, and then let it go. The trick is letting it go. This is not rude, it's about self-respect. Sometimes it feels like such an impossible task. I can see that the road home becomes longer the farther we go. Another thing I learned is that we need to stop fraud compassionately. I internalize, be Cree in how you approach all the challenges in your life. In all matters, we hold all the approval that we're looking for. Be Dene, be Michif, be of this land. I'm reminded, adding blue food coloring to strawberry Kool-Aid will not make a grape. <laughs> It might change the color, but it won't change the way it tastes. Imposter syndrome is a colonial issue. Not feeling enough, that's not ours. I reflect. When I was living in active addiction, I was a chameleon like Wasaki Chak, acting like a week ago to keep myself safe, to keep my spirit sleeping in hibernation for too long. But it's here that I became restless when I knew I was in the wrong. I'm reminded I had a thinking problem. I was not enough. And because of this, I can empathize with why we would want to jump out of our skin in order to be validated, to, to feel value, to be special, to be safe. I was managing the implications of being a targeted person without understanding why we're experiencing distress of being humanized, not just me, but everyone I love. I'm reminded, this is a song that never ends. It can go on and on, my friends. Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was. We're gonna stop singing it because it's not our song. <laughs> It's a song we inherited, and it can keep our minds in crisis, keep us preoccupied from each other, not making eye contact, and this can become lonely, lonely, but we can justify it, too. I saw a correlation between the pretendian issue and MMIWG and how ultimately we are collectively breaking down our families, depending on institutions that deny our humanity, deploying human rights laws against our own sovereignty, keeping ourselves busy with the work to restore our families so far away from home. The relationships that matter most are our kinship responsibilities. How we ourselves, how we see ourselves in relation to each other is often influenced by the state. Internalized colonialism is powered by program programmatic strength. <laughs> I learned that word. Keeping our minds busy, stressed, on alert. I'm reminded that I've felt the weight of the world since my first breath at birth. How do we quiet our minds and allow these clouds to pass? I'm reminded by Maria Campbell, this spring is not like last. I really want to be here today with you. And I've been pinching myself being here cautioning myself not to let my wa mind wander because this is a moment I want to remember for when I need to be empowered. This is where I want to wander off so I can see you again. We cannot expect institutions to protect Indigenous people. And as long as this is going on the way it is, I can see that the cost of indigenization of colonial systems will be the institutionalization of indigenous people. There are people who are letting their fantasies of us erode our reality systemically. This is what made me hide from my own identity. They call it epistemicide. As an auntie, I refuse to stand by. Our children deserve a future to look forward to, to experience their life as they are without being spoon-fed an identity that tears their world apart. There is nothing more crushing than stolen joy of being promised one thing and given another. It's not the promise that's hurt, that hurts. It's the way betrayal feels. 
This is the epitome of grief as I understand it. And there's no amount of thinking that can mend this type of pain. This is not a thinking problem. And thinking thoughts can really get in the way of our journey into ourselves. I'm learning how to quiet my mind, but I'm still so new. Grief feels like having so much love to give and having nowhere to put it, as if having so much to say and no one to speak to. I want you to know, language speakers, that we hear you, but I'm not sure that's true yet. But please don't stop teaching us. It'll be okay. We are safe to be compassionate, to be who we are and how we approach our life, to walk with grace as if we know that we have what it takes collectively. Don't take yourself too seriously. Be flexible in your life so you can see the pathways being revealed to you. But how do we do this in university? I heard about designing ethical space so we don't have to dilute our ways of knowing in the classroom. I learned though we are in relation. I learned though we are in relation, we are each absolute. I'm almost done. <laughs> we have a responsibility to retain our truth, reclaim our roots, reframe our roots. Embodying who we are is an act of resistance. It is an act of refusal. It is an act of self-love. I wonder what a Canadian is. What do Canadians have in common? I think it's toxic guilt. <laughs> and I've felt this, but feeling bad doesn't make you a better person. I've tried. Making yourself feel worse won't do it either. Toxic guilt is e easier than calling on the will to do the work that it takes to counteract the skills made by the state manipulation filled with hate. This is what leads women to be burned at the stake in a sexy, fanatical, salacious expose. And then we feel bad and lick our wounds and we can do this forever. Make no more room for the womb. So be the bad guy if you need. This is not a drama triangle. It's a circle generated by reciprocity. Pita Gwei. Wask away, I hear. Be proud, my girl, of who you are. They say the longest road is from the head to the heart. Our children aren't asking us to pave the way, but they are demanding that we start. Hi, hi, I can ask one thing. <laughs> Uh, that was me that puddle right there oh my gosh I, i'm gonna ask my uh my, my good friend roland to to present these gifts to the witnesses on our collective behalf we've asked these people to do a big job for all of us Thank you, guys. Um, Miigwech. Just wanted to, uh, <clears throat> if we could all just give them a round of applause for sure. capturing our two days. I wasn't supposed to do that part. Holy crow, it's not in this script, but uh, <laughs> let's keep. I, uh, I'm not going to try and capture what these people did for us. You know, I think they've, they've said it all and they've captured it uh, better than this fool ever could. What an amazing way to conclude our forum. <clears throat> Thank you to Zoe Roy, Natasha McDonald, Ryland McCollum, and Missy LeBlanc for your thoughts. Uh, okay, I'm back. I'm back. So I'd like, I'd like, I'd now like to invite Loretta Pete Lambert up to give some closing remarks on behalf of the First Nations University uh, Board of Governors, please. 
<clears throat> Loretta is a practicing lawyer from Little Pine First uh, Cree Nation. She has taught elementary, secondary, and post-secondary school and is a proven successful education administrator. She has served on multiple boards and shown success in governance and leadership. Please join me in welcoming Board, uh, Board of Governors Representative Loretta Pete Lambert. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciated the honor of speaking and closing this wonderful gathering. And uh, lots of voices have been heard today and especially the young people that we just heard that was enlightening because we tend to get a little bit heavy at times. And I think with their words, I found it quite inspiring because they're heart filled and they have hope. And I think that's quite positive. So thank you very much for coming. I will go back to my script and it basically says that we really honor us by coming here to this gathering. And not only did you come in person, but we also had people who were online. We had a virtual audience out there that also participated. And, and that was beautiful because I did, yesterday afternoon, I was on the virtual Zoom meeting and I was absolutely, a, you know, I was so honored and so proud of these academic, academics who were speaking and speaking about the, this issue that's really critical in the area of academia. And also it, it not only is in the area of academia, but it's in other areas where the space reserved for indigenous people has been occupied by, and people have used the word fraudsters, which is, which is true. And I, I, I feel sad for our people that we have been taken advantage of. And me being a criminal lawyer, Yesterday I was speaking on sentencing. <laughs> I thought, how do we get these guys to pay back? They've occupied this space for years and years. They have a good pension plan and they had travel. You know, I, I started thinking and I thought, no, I better go back and be, be peaceful about this. So thank you very much for the university uh, for again, hosting this, the First Nations University of Canada. We have a very, you know, expert and a very committed leader, uh, Dr. Jackie Ottman, who's going to be uh, closing this event today. But I just want to honor her again for for being Indigenous. She is Indigenous. She's First Nations. <laughs> and also me, of course, I'm Indigenous. But the, the beauty of the, the whole process today is to have the dialogue, to, to recognize that all of us come and we have a voice and we can collectively come up with solutions that will help us in the future. This is the only, this is the first step, you know, having the, the conversations and making sure that we try and grapple it with our mind and try and structure it so that we do have the, we find the solutions for this issue. We want our people to occupy those spaces. We want them to profit from them. We want them to thrive. We want our children to see those spaces occupied by those individuals. And that's how we become better and better. So through this kind of work that you did today, we will find strength and healing in our community. Yesterday I talked about community healing through sentencing circles. To me, there is hope when people come together and talk. Dialogue is critical. We can't just run away from issues. We have to speak about them. And this is what it's important today. This is what happened today. So we look forward to having more conversations. And I don't know when the next gathering is going to be on this issue, but certainly your voice is important. And I hope I can hear more on this conversation and hope we can start crafting some way of helping ourselves, how we can make manage genuine genuine ways of, of helping this issue. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> Is it a game? <laughs> it is a game there. <laughs>
No, I don't know if it's a game. I don't think it is a game. I think it's just it's a box of goodies. Thank you very much, Loretta Pete. And before you, while I was uh, trying to compose myself, gosh, I, I didn't get to uh, to explain what the gifts were that we presented to the witnesses. So those are uh, beautiful Kevin P. Ace uh, limited edition prints. Uh, for those of you from uh, the, the plains and the prairies, you might be familiar with Kevin P. Ace. He's, uh, he's from my home community, so I'll exercise some bias there. He's from Yellow Quill First Nation, but uh, he's a phenomenal artist, and uh, we wanted to make sure we... Uh, uh, showed the witnesses how how much we appreciated them, and so hopefully there's one for the MC too. We'll see. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I just can't believe how much like the range of emotions that we had. We 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 seen it all. You know, it was pretty pretty awesome past couple of days. So let's invite Dr. Jacqueline Ottman up uh, to uh, to give us some parting words before we uh, before we close off with a prayer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ottman back to the stage. Wow. Um, you know, when, when we were approached last year, when I was approached last year for First Nations University to be engaged in, in a forum like this, I wasn't sure. I just wasn't sure. And even when we organized alongside National Indigenous University Senior Leaders Association, I wasn't sure again, but knew that this this had to happen, and not really sure about how it it was going to um, evolve. And um, like last year, what what we had asked the elders is to um, prepare the space for truthful and honest, um, constructive, respectful dialogue and um and that's what happened last year online and that's what happened this year it's really affirmational for um for all those that were engaged in preparing this space for you and of course that includes all of the NUSLA members and we have 47 members from across the country and I have an amazing staff. I really do the faculty, the staff, they have put so many hours into this. Mika Taylor um, has, has uh, spent countless hours and weekends into ensuring that the logistics um, and the, the day flowed a certain way that, and, and the people at First Nations University wanted to ensure that you feel welcomed. Um, and I hope you, um, you've you taken uh, the t-shirts that, that, are, that are back there. As I was listening to um, the, um, well, the one incident that emerged during, during this conference, and that was uh, people from outside of our well, probably within our community, but outside of academia, post-secondary. And then I thought, what if we had just called this a conference and really didn't tell people that it was Indigenous only? Would they care, right? As soon as you create a space that is safe for Indigenous peoples, then then you um, people question what uh, what we're talking about, or they wonder what 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 they're talking about, and and these were were um, were also questions that that we fielded um, before we came together. It's not easy to ensure that this was um, uh, focused on post secondary institutions because it's um, this issue is happening in other sectors. Um, there were people that wanted to be a part of this conversation, and it was really hard to say that you. For now, um, we're just going to keep it contained, and uh, the hope is that the circle will get stronger. One of the questions that we we have asked um, in in the questions that are going to go home with you is um, how should the next forum look? And uh, so we're, we're looking forward to to hearing to hearing that answer. Um, there have been a range of emotions, and I'm so glad 
that we have four student witnesses this year, their, their messages are so impactful and powerful. And I look forward to hearing them open uh, the next forum and to see how uh, they carry on this message uh, within their circles. And I, I also hope that they feel supported um, by our Indigenous communities or our Indigenous community within post-secondary education and by our elders and by allies. And my hope is that our institutions will change and there's beginning to be more of us within, within university settings. And, um, and so with that, I think there's gonna be more, um, more force, more force for change. This has, um, you know, just, I've had so many thoughts, thoughts over these last two days. And um, I've been married to a, a non-Indigenous man for 36 years. And actually we've been together for 41. But uh, so, you know, since high school, never once has he taken my voice. He's always stepped aside and he said, she can speak to this. My daughter. was also hurt by, by someone claiming to be indigenous. And she went to, um, now it's called uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and um, she was with um, someone that she thought was a friend during that whole time. And in most of her classes, she was the only Indigenous person. And, and of course, was called on about, for on Indigenous um, topics. And uh, two years after she left um, uh, TMU, um, this young lady started getting arts grants. And... Um, And so, you know, my daughter just questioned what this was all about and why didn't they have this conversation about her indigeneity and online, um, this young lady's uh, sister was saying, well, they're approximately 10% indigenous. And, um, and then we started having these conversations about, you know, mom, how do I address this? And she talked to close friends and and then she felt compelled to write her. She wrote her and said, I, I, I felt betrayed. Um, why didn't you speak up in class if you felt that you were indigenous or even as an ally? So it wasn't until a year later that this young lady wrote her back and thanked her for that letter, for that email. Um, and that's what we, we hope for, I think, is that when we, uh, when we share our truth, that, um, that there will be change. And I'm not sure where the... Um, you know where the change for this young woman is at, but but it's 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 opened her up, and um, and so we've been impacted in in very different ways. And one word that I've used um, ever since I came to First Nations University of Canada is um, Weniska. And there was another word for for waking up, and um, our elders. 
um, have this film and it's an award-winning film and it is called Wadniska, Wake Up. And um, I've heard I've heard that said many times. It's the same word in our in our our Soto language. Wadniska, Wake Up. And um, you know sometimes it takes us a while to wake up, but um, and this is what we've been doing is trying to make the rest, our, our post-secondary institutions wake up. And I've been surprised at some of the statistics that we've heard about approximately 25% uh, within the academy maybe uh, uh, claiming an indigenous identity, that there are thousands that, that may be claiming indigenous identity throughout the country. Um, and who's impacted? Um, it's it's indigenous peoples, and um, and as I mentioned earlier, I really do hope that that dialogue and forums like this will inspire something bigger. Whether it, whether they are principles, whether they are um, recommendations, whether it's a charter that that post secondary institutions can take and use. Um, that will also guide them in creating change and affirming uh, Indigenous identity, Indigenous peoples when it, within our institutions. Um, and I, I really appreciate the, um, the difference that, that was um, um, made clear to us, and we have different perspectives on, on concepts, but, but the difference between kindness and being nice. Um, Elder Reg Kroshu, um, someone that I, I just have learned so much from, and he's Blackfoot from, um, from Ghana, and he, he said that uh, he speaks of sanctified kindness. And it's taken, I mean, I still reflect on that concept of sanctified kindness. And um, for me, as in the leadership roles that I've had these last few years, um, many times I've had to step away and just walk until I reach that space of, of sanctified kindness so I can come back and deal with this, deal whatever the issue is with firmness, but in ways that really draw upon our indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. So if you see me walking, <laughs> that's probably what that's all about. Um, talk to each other, support each other. And, um, you know, as we've come together uh, through an association, NOLSA, because within these spaces in post-secondary institu institutions, senior leaders have very few people that they can talk to. And you know we we have um, confidentiality agreements, um, and and so this space is is uh, and I've heard those words supportive for the forty seven members, and hopefully we'll have more. Um, and then we can also come together to examine uh, the report that will emerge from this conference and say what can we do about this. Right, and um, and so get to uh, from the bottom of my heart, um, my whole being um, for for bringing your whole selves to to this uh, conversation. It wasn't easy, and it'll take us a few days, I think, to bounce back from from all of the emotional energy that that we felt and that we've expended um, over the two days. And uh, but that means that we've done some work. Um, that means that we've been fully present. And uh, so so thank you. I thank the elders for uplifting this space, um, for the pipe being lifted over two days. It stayed intact, um, and um, and and just for each and every one of you for traveling for those that are that are um that are online thank you thank you for um for being here um and so 
I just want to also um, just extend my appreciation to Neil uh, for how how he just brought us through, moved us through the space with with humor, uh, maybe some awkwardness, but <laughs> but it was. I mean, Neil, you you are so good at what you do, and uh, thank you for saying yes. Um, yes to us once again, and I've got a gift for you. Mm -hmm. I got a gift for you. I'm not a bragger, but oh my God, I'm just going to be bragging all the way home. I just can't wait to phone my dad. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys are awesome. Holy smokes. Uh, I think it's time to just start saying thank you to everyone. It, it's it's getting, uh, it's been a long two days. Uh, let's start with some of our tech team. No, these guys have been phenomenal. The one guy hasn't even slept in two days. <laughs> yeah, they've been phenomenal to us. I want to thank our hotel staff for keeping us all nice and fed and, and uh, just taking care of awesome. Our organizers, Mika Taylor was mentioned there, uh, Jacqueline Ottman as well too. Everybody, you know, I, I just can't say enough about this. Uh, save your applause, I'm gonna list off 23 uh, group of sponsors and then we'll just give them a nice big one right at the end. First Nations University of Canada, Brock University, Concordia University, McGill University, Mount Royal University, University of Saskatchewan, University of Toronto, University of Victoria, University of Waterloo, Western University, the Canadian Institute for Health Research, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, Memorial University, University of Regina, Carleton University, University of Windsor, Cape Breton University, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, University of Alberta, University of Prince Edward Island, Lakehead University, and last but definitely not least, the University of Calgary. Can we please give all of these sponsors a very uh, big round of applause for bringing us together. We've got uh, Harvey Thunderchild, who's going to close us off in, in prayer with uh, Joe Netauhau as well, too. I just wanted to leave you all, though, with some words <clears throat> that were, they were the literal last words that uh, I ever heard from my chum's mouth. That's what we call our grandfather in my, in Soto, in my, where I come from. But uh, like I just, uh, and there was two people in the room when he said it, me and my older brother, and, and he said it very Knowingly, there was two different people in the room, but he said the same thing to both of us, you know, and I offer the same thing to you. It meant different things to, to me and my brother, but you'll know what it means for you. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Magwetch. On Wakumaganti. I say me na kisitana no Mamma Wopun Magakamam Tanatama Kawi Kiwea Tansumigisi Igitota Mota Motanisagiska Eima Pigscon Ewi Sakska go Oma Nehion Eu como agora estou gasto muito, mas quando eu estou mal, eu estou em mal, mas eu sou porque eu gasto sim o ano de muitos estudos, eu sou porque eu estou mal, mas eu gito com ele, não posso mal, eu não quero ir. A vida que eu gasto está com essa coisa mal. In my language, I think everybody being here, it's a lot hard couple days. Of talking about the issues that plague us right now. And I think we go home back to our home fires and continue on doing the work that you do. And I think of all my life listening to my elders and my brother Joe here, we grew up together in Prince Albert when he spoke about our basketballs. Stuff, you know, we were the basketball, we were the team to reckon with in Prince Albert back in our days. Yeah. <laughs> We were the tall ones, my brother. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I, I think, you know, life gives us joy. I, I've had my journey, wonderful journey throughout my life. From Joe talked about his uh, rambunctious life, and we all have rambunctious life. And I think of, you know, no, no different from mine, from gang life to where I am today. Playing sports, professional sports for 22 years. Going back to school to achieve degrees from University of Saskatchewan and Algoma University in Ontario. But believing in yourself and the things that you do, these young people that spoke earlier, never deny anybody to put you down. And today, being a cultural support worker for University of Saskatchewan, I connect with the Indigenous students pretty well every day. Students that come to my office that they can't talk to anybody else, where professors are telling the students, if you cannot do the work that you do, take a break. It's not about that. There's differences that these kids face every day. It's not about the school. Stress factors comes with everything, whether it's home life, single parents, affordability. These are the things that these kids are facing every day. Joe and I listen to all the students pretty well every week. We meet pretty well every week, just to discuss it. what can we do? What more can we do to help these kids? I got the ears, I got the hearts to be able to channel information to these kids. How come more? How come more? You know, today, <clears throat> my family, my brother, my nieces and nephews, my sisters, they and don't ever quit in the things that you have passion to. And the kids that I talked to and the young people that spoke to you earlier, don't let anybody deter you from something that you believe in and want to achieve. And I think with that, I think uh, I'll say my prayer and Joe <clears throat> is going to sing a song. And I think, like I said, this was a hard couple of days from talking to people in the last couple of days. And I think it's hard. Yeah, it's a hard subject to talk about. And I think uh, <clears throat> we as individuals, we grew up with people uh, with that mentality of proclaiming of who they are. I talked to a lady, I heard the lady earlier talk about hockey. You know, I played hockey in Michigan. I was called a wagon burner, child molester when I was young, but you got to grow thick skin. You got to be able to say to yourself, you're just as better as anybody else. Nothing different. Ted Nolan said the same thing. Ted Nolan is a good friend of mine. He was my neighbor in Garden River, Ontario. We always talk about Situations like this, I get calls from Alberta, minor hockey, kids that are playing midget hockey, junior A hockey, the problems that they're facing racism. I get calls from families and I call Ted. This is what's happening in Alberta. They have a program, Ted Nolan and his kids, to deal with this racism in minor hockey system. And when I do get calls, he's the first one that I call because they know what to do. Reggie Leach, you know, all these people that played NHL before know how to deal with those situations. あ、ま、もうたまくまくのなん。いつなんかこうしてくれとたま。え、外国語がパカンスカゴ。こうしかもうて。あとすけうい no, 
Say no go up in that was Pogana. No, give me none. Nagatim, which got poised. Our mamma with time in the Agam is in his casquita and is sent to the man. Me up matsu, here got suksi, give my guys mamsi watta, Nagatogasia. And not a motata tagi, but me up matsu. I accept the mamma more time. I'm so ask it out up. It's going to be a scat and a big scat and a no. Except the man. Oh. So I want to invite Anna Lee to come and sing it with me here. We uh, work together at the University of Regina, and uh, we often sing together. We sing to French, French people there. And this is a song uh, that says, uh, it's basically a song you're singing for when you welcome people. Kind of sing it at the end here, but uh, Dumskagi and uh, Mio Austin, it's called Mio Austin, and you know the song here. Mm -hmm. And we don't need the mic here, so we'll do uh, Mio Austin, and then I'll do uh, we know, Kikawi no Ki to Namu, you know, Kakuisagi, the mother, or father, mother, try to love one another, and we got to kill the guppy. Um, it's not indefinite as to when, how long we're going to be here. So that's the, the two songs and back to back. Move up here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Same me,
travels back to Tamskat Nagakio. Thank you. Thank you, sister. <laughs> 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 <laughs>